Um, as we get started this morning, in the light of Thanksgiving, I just wanted to share with you the verse that you all know very well, Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And what it means when it says to bless, bless him, it means to express praise and thanksgiving. And as we talked about last week, that's not only, it's easy to bless him and thank him and praise him in the good times, but especially in the tough times. We thank him and we praise him, even in the, when we stand in the presence of our enemies and when our unbelief is screaming louder at us. Amen? Amen. So in everything we go through, what the enemy means for harm, God will always use for our good if we allow it to. So why don't you stand with me as we prepare our hearts just to go before the Lord in our worship. Father, we just thank you and praise you that we can stand here and worship you and we just position ourselves before you as an audience of one. May we sing these praises from our hearts to yours as we bless your name. Amen.
Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the words of David that said, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head oh, I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful So good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful the goodness of God. Oh, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. It's your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now, I give you everything. It's your goodness is running after, We do thank you for your goodness this morning. We thank you that you are always good. 
and we just want to worship you and exalt you in this time. Father, if you want to speak anything to our hearts as we're worshiping you, as we're quieting our hearts, as we're singing unto you, we just open ourselves up and allow you to speak to us and bring us to a deeper place with you during this time, Father. Pour out our 
we just thank you and praise you that we can worship you and put you in your rightful place in our hearts put you on the throne of our hearts and declare that you are Lord over all you are Lord over our hearts Lord over our lives Lord over everything there's no better place to be than in the center of your will and father we ask that as we've had this time that you prepared our hearts for the word that is about to come that it would fall on good soil and take root and grow and we would grow to be more like you just be with Colin as he comes speak through him and bless his words in Jesus name amen well good morning if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Romans. We're going to be in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 this morning. Let me just say how thankful that I am to be a part of such a great church. Here's the reality. There's a lot of churches out there, but finding one where the elders will pour into the faith family like these elders do, it's amazing and it's wonderful. And so as we near Thanksgiving, uh, that is what I am thankful for. Uh, children's are, children are dismissed to children's church. We're going to get started. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Paul writes, and he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, you are so good and you are so righteous and holy. And I pray that we would grow in you. That you would just move in a wondrous way. That you would, that you would just have your your way with us this morning, Lord, that you would meet with us. I pray that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds, that you would open our ears to the good grace that you give. We love you so much, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. My question to you this morning is, what would make someone give up those addictions, or what would make someone who has so much shame and insecurities not ashamed anymore? What old Rutland, Vermont, time after time, has a bad reputation by other places? There has been the Boston Globe that has written about the drug epidemic in Rutland, Vermont. And so as I, I read this text and I, I, I ask those questions, what would make someone give up the addictions? What would make someone give up all the shame and all the insecurities that have been pent up for so many years? The answer is this. The answer is the gospel. Today, and I'm speaking in general terms, because if there was a church overseas heard me saying this, they would probably laugh at me. So hear me out when I say this. Today it is hard to be a Christian. Now what I mean by that is I don't, I, yeah, I'm thankful that we can open our Bibles, that we can walk into this sanctuary, that we can advertise on Facebook, that we can say the name of Jesus. I'm not saying that, that 
we're being persecuted like that. But what I am saying is a lot of people that are looking from an outward perspective would say that we have an archaic religion. The world is changing. We need to change with it. We're bigots. We're um, so many narrow-minded. Uh, the, the, the list goes on and on and on. When I was given this opportunity to preach and trying to come up with what to say, I thought to myself, you know what? I am so thankful for my family. I am so thankful for my children. I'm so thankful for this church. I'm so thankful for our pastors and elders. But the most, the, the, the one standalone thing that I am thankful for is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I remember a time, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background history on me. I, I didn't grow up a, a Christian. So I went through high school. I went to Rutland High School, and I was so insecure. I, I wanted to be the most popular person, and so I, I, I tried to hang out with those people. I would do whatever I possibly could to fit in, and it was exhausting, y'all. Week after week after week of going to different parties and, do, and living the life of the world. My identity was found in that. My purpose was found in that, which is so shallow. And I think that's why I love students, because they're at that age where we can invest and we can say that their identity can be found in Jesus, that their purpose can be found in Jesus that they don't have to live that exhausting life. But I remember I was 18 years old. I dropped out of college. I moved back home. My brother Josh and I are very competitive. Um, and I, I remember him, uh, we were bowling one night, and he was asking me, or he was, he was talking to me about Jesus. He had become a Christian. So he was talking about Jesus. I wanted nothing to do with it. I didn't want to hear about it, but we're bowling and we're competitive. And so he says, you know what? He says, you win, I'll buy you this watch that I like. I win, you have to go to church with me. <laughs> and so the Lord has a sense of humor because I've never lost to him in bowling. And uh, when you know that that night I lost to him. But we, um, I, I went to church. I went to church in uh, West Paulet. Meadowy Valley Church. I had to go there three weeks. We played double or nothing. So it was three weeks in a row. <laughs> and, um, and I remember giving my life to Jesus. I remember uh, realizing that I was in need of a Savior because I was a sinful person and that Jesus was the perfect spotless lamb and he died for my sins. That was November 14, 2010. And so all of my friends that I had at that moment, I'm going somewhere with this story. All, all of my friends that I had at that moment were unbelievers. I, I didn't realize that, that, you know, so I'm still hanging out with people that were unbelievers. I'm a new Christian. And I remember my best friend saying to me, oh, I heard your brother's into that church and Jesus stuff. And I was a Christian at the time. And you know what I said? Yeah, it's kind of weird. Be because I was so new and I, was, I didn't know what to say. I was embarrassed almost. And I hate to say that from stage this morning. So where I'm getting at is a lot of times for someone who doesn't have their faith intact, you can almost hide your faith and hang out with the wrong group of people and not evangelize and not be that light or that beacon of hope. But Paul makes it evident when he says, and I believe when he is writing this, that he grips his pen a little bit harder and he digs that ink just a little bit deeper when he says that I am not ashamed of the gospel. I, I can imagine a bolstering voice when he says that, when he's writing this, he isn't just saying, well, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He is saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. 
For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul writes this to the Christians in Rome around AD 57. He is in Corinth and will be going to Rome, he hopes, shortly. But a lady named Phoebe comes alongside of him, and he knows that Phoebe is going to Rome. And so he pens the letter to the Roman church, and he sends it with Phoebe to get there. This is Paul's third missionary journey. He's fearing that he may die before getting to Rome. This is Paul's most extensive letter showing his understanding of the gospel. He had been imprisoned in Philippi, chased out of Thessalonica, smuggled out of Berea, laughed at in Athens, regarded as a fool in Corinth, and stoned in Galatia. And even after all of that, Paul's desire was to preach in Rome, the seat of contemporary political power and pagan religion. So then I ask myself as a reader looking on, what did you have, Paul? What kept you going? Why were you so eager? The answer is simple. The answer is the gospel. Three reasons that Paul isn't ashamed of the gospel. The first one, stay with me real quick. The first one we find in verse 16. The gospel reveals God's power. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. We see God's power in his word when he creates everything in Genesis. We see God's power in his ability to to part the seas. We see God's power when he destroys cities, when he destroys armies. But I believe the single most, the greatest evidence for God's power comes by the gospel. I fully believe that. That is the climax to this whole redemptive story. Power in the Greek is called dynamis. That's where we get our word dynamite. Now, I am no expert when it comes to dynamite, but I do remember at the very young age of the Diamond Run Mall being built, they had to blast rock. And I remember my mother taking me up there to watch that. And I remember how much of an impact that little thing had when it went boom. All of a sudden there was a big smoke and there was some, some shaking going on. And I remember the, the rock that they were trying to blast all of a sudden was gone. And I think about that, and I was thinking about this during this week, and I was thinking, isn't it funny how this small thing that we could hold in our hands has such a great impact? You know, the thing about dynamite, it isn't the shell that's powerful. It's what is inside. That shell may be broken, that shell may be battered, that shell may be torn, that shell may look a little different, that shell may seem a little different, that shell may, uh, you know, have an off tint or something like that. That shell may have something that we would look at and say it's ugly, but that shell still does it and it will still work through you if you have the Holy Spirit, God's power living inside of you. We are God's shells, and he wants to use each and every one of us. There's a similar reference that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, where it says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It shows God's power. That's number one. Number two. The gospel shows or reveals God's plan, 
his plan is to seek and to save that which was lost, right? We find a great story from the Old Testament to the New Testament about how God chose this nation through Abraham. His descendants would be blessed. There's an Abrahamic covenant. There is a transaction between God and Abraham himself. And through the years, we see Israel. And we see Israel's unfaithfulness, and we see God's grace and God's mercy poured out. But this is a kind of cool time, because now salvation is open to the Greek. Power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Whoever believes to the Jew and also to the Greek. You know what that means? Greek in this terminology would really just be someone who isn't a Jew. Anyone. Salvation is extended to anyone and everyone who would believe and trust in Jesus Christ. And you know what the cool thing is? The same thing that Paul is writing in Romans is the same thing that's happening today. That the gospel is extended out to anyone who would believe in Jesus. Romans 3.23 says, let's actually flip right to it. For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And Romans 10.13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know what we see there? We see that God's plan is salvation to his people, extending out to the Jew, to the Gentile, to anyone that would believe in the name of Jesus. Which is great news for all of us. Because I'm nothing but a Gentile. And at one time, my Gentileness would um, not be allowed in a place uh, where a Jew was, and I would be looked at as filthy and dirty. And there would be a cultural division But the Bible tells us that Gentiles are grafted in to God just as the Jews. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Paul's not ashamed because he sees God's power. He sees the power of God and sending his son to die on a cross for you and for me. Being buried in a borrowed tomb for three days and raising himself back to life by the power of his own spirit so that you and I can now believe in Jesus. The gospel is the greatest thing that has ever happened. During this time of thanksgiving, this is the thing that we need to be thankful for the most. Paul is eager because he understands what exactly the gospel does. The gospel changes, the gospel transforms, the gospel makes new, the gospel gives life to the dead. The gospel does all of this, and it's so good that the gospel is still doing that today. I don't know where everyone is this morning. I don't know what your heart is. I don't know where your relationship with the Lord is, but going to church is not enough. Head knowledge of Jesus is not enough. Jesus tells the Pharisee that you must be born again. What that means is you have to confess of your sins, put your hope and faith and trust in Jesus, and live for him and die to yourself. That's what Paul did. He went from the law-abiding Jew. He went from the law-abiding Pharisee to now someone 
who has made three missionary journeys. He's been persecuted beyond measure, but he says his hope is in Jesus, and while you can take away his body and while you can damage it, you cannot damage his soul. And that is the same thing for you and I today. Not only do we see God's power, not only do we see God's plan, but the gospel shows us God's perfection. And that's the, the, the greatest thing of all. You and I are not perfect. You probably know that, but if you did not know that, I hate to be a, a buzzkill this morning to you. You are not perfect. The Bible actually says that, that you are a sinner. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you are dead in your sin. You are a slave to your sin. But there is good news. While we cannot buy our way to heaven, while we cannot beg our way to heaven, while we cannot earn our way to heaven, Jesus, God himself, knew that. And God sends his son, Jesus, to be born as a babe, to live a sinless, perfect life, to die on a cross, and to take up the, the, the punishment that you and I were to bear. There is one that is perfect, and his name is Jesus. He is the perfect, spotless lamb of God. And we find that in verse 17, where it says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Reading on verse 17, a lot of people have issues and a lot of people are divided on exactly what this means. But everything that I can come up with from my Bible would show us that we are not righteous. That says in Psalm 310, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. So while we're unrighteous and God is righteous, it says that the righteous shall live by faith. So what do we do with this? Well, God, you, I, I want to be righteous, and I have faith, but the Bible says I can't, and I, I'm confused. It's his righteousness that lives in us. Something supernatural happened November 14, 2010, when I gave my life to Jesus. It was a supernatural work. While I confessed my sins and I put my faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ, he took up residence within me. When he looks down on little old Colin Terenzini, he does not see the, the, the sinner that I once was, but he sees his son's righteousness, the one who came and died for you and for me. I have a seat at the table of the king. If you are a believer in Christ, you are adopted by the king himself. He has given you all the riches in the world. He says, come and sit with me at this table. Feast with me. I made reference as a joke last time I preached about how high this pulpit was and sitting at the big kid's table at Thanksgiving. I don't want to circle back to that, but I do remember there is a distinction between the little kid's table and the big kid's table. And, I, and I, I hear my son saying, can I sit with you, Daddy? Can I sit with you? And no, son, you got that table over there. Can I sit with you, Daddy? He wants to sit with his daddy at the table. The father allows us to sit at the table and feast with him. If you know him this morning, you have that luxury. That while you may be insecure and you may have shame in so much because this world is messy, you do not need to have shame in the power of the gospel, 
in God's plan and in God's righteousness and his perfection because he gives it to us. So now I can say, I have righteousness not by me, but by Christ because he lives inside of me this morning. So if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, what a great time. I'm thankful that you're here this morning, and I want to offer that to you. Jesus came to this world. He lived a perfect, sinless life, and he died as though he were the chief sinners for you and for me so that we can have a spot at the king's table. And knowing a church or knowing someone in a church or knowing um, something of Jesus will not get you to heaven. It does not mean that you are saved. You are saved by the grace of God. He has given you his son where you can believe in him and make him your Lord and master today. I want to pray for us this morning. Father God, you are so good and you are so gracious. Your word, Father, tells us that we do not have to be ashamed of the gospel. And Father, I remember as a new Christian hanging out with unbelievers, I hid my faith. And Father, reading the words of Paul this morning, I realized that in 2019, rolling into 2020, we do not need to be ashamed of the gospel. We can yell it from the rooftops because it is the most important thing in our lives. And so, Father, I just thank you that you have revealed your power in the gospel. I I thank you that you have revealed your, your plan in the gospel for salvation. And, Father, I, I am so thankful that you have revealed your perfection in the gospel where we can look at ourselves and see imperfection, but we look to you and see that perfection. And Father, thank you for living inside of us. So Father, I pray that if someone here does not know you, that they wouldn't waste another minute, that they would give their life to Jesus and make it known. Father, we love you so much, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.